Resting on the shoulders of the Great Lakes, Ontario is filled with vast amounts of fresh water. Below the water surface, entire communities come to life. Spiny fishes, diving ducks, forests of vegetation, each plays a critical role in maintaining a balance in the food web, building habitat and filtering nutrients. But these species, and the waters they call home, are under threat and scientists across sectors are working to better understand how to protect them. There's about 35,000 species of fishes. I don't think too many people realize this, but if you add up all the rest of the vertebrates, so that's mammals, birds, amphibians and reptiles, they don't even make up to 35,000. There's just way more fish in the world, so of course they're going to have a greater impact on the ecosystem. When we don't respect freshwater ecosystems, we place a lot of things at risk. Freshwater is a scarce resource and probably the most important resource on the planet uh, for sustaining human life. And so having these canaries in the coal mine, these, these fish communities that can tell us about the health of that ecosystem um, is, is really important. And what they're telling us is not good news. Overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, rising temperatures, these threats all negatively impact fish populations. But one of the biggest threats to native fishes, non-native fishes. Well, I would say there are two criteria for invasive species. One, that it's non-native, that it didn't exist in a habitat historically, and two, that it's problematic. It's one of the things that would separate invasive species typically from native species is that they can tolerate more things. They are more generalist. So they can come from a different habitat into the habitat that they did not evolve in, still find it just fine, maybe even good enough that they can compete and outcompete native species. There's just so many links in nature that are broken when we start altering the conditions in which these things have evolved over thousands and thousands of years. And that's what invasive species do. They break those connections down. Some of the earliest introductions, um, not of fishes, but of other aquatic invasive species, largely smaller individuals, have, have occurred since the 1800s as a result of ballast water uh, transfers. While many invasive species have been introduced accidentally, recent introductions of non-native species are more intentional, like releasing exotic pets in the wild or using them to control pests. Some of these introductions have backfired, exactly the case with four species of carps originating from Eastern Asia. These carp species, each one has kind of a unique superpower, a unique ability that gives it dominance over other native fishes in the Great Lakes. And in an environment uh, here where it escapes natural predation and, and uh, natural parasites, natural disease, their populations can explode. And in very large numbers, they can impact the ecosystem in very significant ways. In Canada, the species we're most concerned about is the grass carp, mostly because it, uh, it has been spotted here in Toronto back in 2015. Thankfully, we haven't seen it since. They're also a voracious eater of plants and could do some real damage to our wetlands. The main reason that grass carp were brought to North America in the first place is to help control vegetation and ponds, but often those ponds would be flooded and then the fish would get into the wild. And that's how we think grass carp became established in the Mississippi River. And then they started spreading from where they were initially established. And they moved upstream into the Illinois River, which actually is connected through a canal to the Great Lakes. And that's why we're, we're really concerned about grass carp. And we know they're close, right? They're, they're now spawning in uh, several rivers in Lake Erie on the American side. It's hard to believe they're not going to be coming up here, let's just say that. If we were only concerned over grass carp alone, Scientists are closely watching three other species belonging to the same family, Xenocypridae. Big head and silver carps consume phyto and zooplankton, and then by changing those zooplankton ecosystems, that can have trophic cascades throughout the uh, rest of the environment. And then finally, the black carp consumes uh, mussels, and we have a lot of endangered mussels within our Great Lakes ecosystems, and we definitely want to be mindful and try to conserve their health as well. Collectively, these species have the potential to drastically alter the Great Lakes ecosystems. 
they can make the whole food chain collapse. And what depends on the food chain? Everything that we value. It's estimated that the impact of the establishment of grass carp or any one of the, those invasive carp species in the Great Lakes could, could cost billions of dollars in terms of uh, loss to recreation, uh, including um, aesthetic use of the, the Great Lakes, uh, boating, fishing, you know, they're going to have tremendous ecological and economic impacts. Invasive species are a direct problem that we have created and that we can solve. Researching invasive species is an integral component of preventing their establishment. Dr. Nicholas Mandrak, a research biologist at University of Toronto, leads studies that are critical to making informed conservation management plans. My lab, we have been doing research that identifies what streams would be suitable for the spawning of these invasive carps. This is where they're most likely to, going to show up first. So this allows DFO to um, prioritize where they're going to monitor for the early detection of invasive carps. Dr. Paul Bizonek's study at the RBG Fishway focuses on how to physically prevent invasive species from expanding range. Non-structured deterrents are one of the tools in the toolbox where we try to stop the movement of uh, target species, largely invasive species, but still allow for the movement of uh, water flow or human shipping um, and other transportations of goods. And so these tools can include sound and light, carbon dioxide or electricity, uh, tools that produce a stimuli that the fish avoid, um, but don't produce a structural barrier within the waterway. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada takes a proactive stance, monitoring for the presence of grass, silver, big head, and black carp prior to their invasion. They also partner with conservation authorities to monitor local watersheds. When you get into that control and management phase, the, the expense involved with that is just uh, exponentially more than stopping these different species from getting in in the first place. Electrofishing is one of the methods DFO uses to surveil the Great Lakes and surrounding watersheds for these potential invaders, focusing on areas most suitable for their establishment. Electrofishing is a type of sampling method where we use electric fields to actually encourage fish to come towards our net. So as the electricity is moving out um, into the water, the muscles of the fish are actually kind of manipulated by this electrical field and then that allows us to scoop them up. DFO also uses fike, gill, and trap nets to perform monitoring surveys, allowing for the detection of juveniles that often escape the electrical field. If they were to show up in the Great Lakes, that would be a big deal. So we would immediately be sending crews out and sampling, you know, targeting uh, uh, high efforts into trying to find any additional fish and removing them. When we fish, swim, and recreate in Ontario waters, we become part of the monitoring team. Posters can be found in marinas across the Great Lakes, teaching anglers and other recreational boaters how to identify and respond if they spot an invasive species. Spend your time, read them, learn what could possibly be destroying you know, the body of water that you've grown up on or, or have fished in all your life. The more eyes that we have out there looking for them and, and notifying authorities, if you do see an invasive species, the greater chance we have to respond appropriately in an early enough time frame to actually stop that invasion in its tracks. While the role of science in monitoring is important, so too is the role of education. At Royal Ontario Museum, we bring the classroom to life teaching visitors how invasive species impact native wildlife and holding fish identification workshops. Imagine seeing the lake you grew up on filled with murky waters, home to only a handful of fish species and few recognizable natives. And the damage doesn't stop in the water, but flows into fishing, tourism, and outdoor recreation industries. These aren't tall tales, they're the reality in ecosystems where these species have established. Join us in protecting our waters. Our native fishes depend on us, and we depend on them. Mm -hmm.